My number one best chess game of the 1930s is Tolkovsky versus Wojciechowski from Poznan, 1931. Now, there's a good chance that you've never heard of these two players, but there's also a great chance that you have seen the incredibly beautiful and incredibly famous combination that ends this game. It was first published as Orchuetta vs. Sanz in 1933. In fact, the story behind this game is incredibly complex and there are many questions about the game's legitimacy. The game was first published in 1936 in full with a completely different set of moves leading up to the combination, but the final combination is almost the same. It was annotated at that time by Jose Capablanca. Now, even at that time, there were questions about the game's legitimacy. The game was supposed to have been played in Spain, but it didn't seem to be associated with any particular tournament or circumstances that one could really verify. Witnesses were really lacking. Additionally, some at the time said this is basically so beautiful, it feels like it's really a post-mortem where there was this incredible idea that came up in the game and then the game was made to fit the combination that was seen in the post-mortem. This has certainly happened in some cases before and it's how some incredible studies have been created. Of course, it's really impossible to know and things were made much, much more complicated when decades later the game was published as Tolkowski vs. Wojciechowski played in Poznan, Poland in 1931. Again, there were questions about the game's legitimacy. Where was the game played? Well, basically in the local chess scene, in probably a pub, surrounded by local chess players, some of whom did account for the game and testify to its legitimacy. However, the actual player, Wojciechowski, who played for Poland's Olympiad team, was dead. He had passed in 1938 at a still young age from pneumonia. Throughout his life, he suffered from ill health. Again, people said, could this be, you know, basically fabricated after the fact? Well, we'll basically never know. I encourage you to check out Tim Crabbe's blog on this subject if you're interested in as much detail as you can possibly get. We only get further and further from the actual events, so we probably will never have more information than is documented in his blog. Personally, I tend to believe that Tolkovsky vs. Wojciechowski is the correct attribution. There are various reasons for this, but I basically find the players and circumstances credible, and I don't see any real reason to fake a game by a player who passed so long ago. Whereas I can certainly understand questionable motivations on other sides in this particular set of circumstances. It's also possible though that both games were played, both are accurate, and the finishing combination is an incredible coincidence. Again, who will know? In any case, it's incredibly beautiful, and I hope that you enjoy this game. Tolkowski opens the game here with pawn to f4, birds opening. Now, as a longtime birds opening player myself, I can say that this opening is for the birds. However, one needs to find some opening, and sometimes one doesn't like to learn theory. I can certainly relate. That's how I ended up here. After f4, we see pawn d5. E3, C5, both players are playing very, very natural moves, not very theoretical moves, which is why players often like birds. So we're getting exactly that here. Now, bishop B5, this is very, very common because you often want to exchange off this bishop here for the knight, weakening black's pawn structure, and then you will have one very good bishop and you'll try to center your game around the strength of that bishop. After bishop B5, we see bishop to G4, castles, E6, D3, bishop B7, very standard. I've had this position many times. Now, knight C3. This is a little bit of a mistake because the knight really belongs on D2 so that you you don't allow any kind of opportunities and pawn pushes for black that might be favorable. At this point, black gets a little bit too optimistic and plays d4. You basically don't want to play this move because you're going to create so many weak squares in your position by advancing the pawn, and now white can get a very big advantage with bishop takes c6 check. In fact, white doesn't do this, and it's a good move on this move and the next move, and white is missing a strong opportunity because after pawn takes, this pawn structure is really bad, and knight a4, eventually bringing this knight around over to uh, c4 is very, very strong. And you have other ideas as well, like b3 and then bishop a3 going after this pawn. And if black ever captures on e3, then you're just isolating these pawns over here. So 
all possible permutations for black in this position are undesirable. So after d4, though, we don't get the exchange on c6, which is a little bit painful for me. Knight b1, knight f6, pawn to e4. This is a nice position, but you didn't need to push this because, as we already said, you were getting a good position anyway. And again, you should take on c6. Castles, bishop takes c6. Finally here, pawn takes c6. And instead of being like, yes, I got my nice pawn structure, I'll be stable, I'll play b3, I'll put my knight on a good square, I'll put pressure on c5, white decides c3 is the right move to play. And this is very frustrating. Again, as a bird's opening player myself, I'm like, I would love to have these positions. And instead, we're kind of just discarding all of the great advantages that we've had. Now, at this point, and for the next X number of moves, black has an opportunity to play C4. And C4 just continues to be fantastic, and black does not play it. Much like my frustration with white not taking on C6 in an opportune way, I'm very frustrated that C4 was never ever played. Now, after C4, a key line here is pawn takes C4, knight takes C4, and now you cannot take with the queen on uh, D4 because there's bishop C5 with a hilarious pin love that but you can take with the pawn the thing is here black can play moves like bishop f6 pawn c5 rook b8 maybe queen b6 there's so many things that black can do to put pressure on white in this position all of black's pieces are ending up on great squares and black just has a very nice advantage in a great position instead though after c3 we don't get the c4 break we get pawn takes c3, which is a bit sad. Knight takes c3, uh, bishop takes f3, rook takes f3, and now c4 is again an excellent move, right? Pawn takes, and you can trade on d1, take on e4, great position. Instead, though, we get kind of an ostensibly active move with knight g4. King h1 kind of dodging the check here on d4, and uh, queen still comes into d4. Queen e1 is the best way to respond here because the queen is very flexible here. And instead, white goes for queen over to g1, kind of insisting on a queen trade, but the queen trade comes with some issues. Queen takes g1, king takes, and bishop uh, back to d8 uh, instead, of <laughs> instead of, again, c4, which was great because the bishop can go to c5, and then you have knight f2 check, or you have knight takes h2 depending on where the king goes so again a great opportunity and instead the bishop goes back to d8 it's very very sad to see black never ever play c4 um anyway bishop d8 bishop e3 uh knight takes rook takes and now bishop to b6 c4 is a serious threat and now rook d1 to kind of deal with that threat so that c4 can be met with d4 uh even though that's still a good idea for black. Um, instead here, knight a4 was a good alternative, saying, all right, hey, why don't I just eliminate your bishop? Um, so that was a good way to deal with it because now you can't play c4 and white can slowly build up. But rook d1 was played instead of knight a4. And now <laughs> instead of c4, we get pawn to h6, making left, and pawn to e5. I think this intends to put the knight on e4 but finally, uh, actually, still we don't get c4, but again, it was the right move. f6, pawn takes f6, rook takes f6, rook f3, and now c4. I thought we were going to get it a moment ago, but finally c4. So this is move 22, and c4 has been good for 10 moves in a row. Finally, we get it, and it's been much better at earlier junctures. But here we go. At this point, it was best just to move the king, king over to f1, but we'd get d4 now. And at this point, best is just to put pressure on the d-pawn. This d-pawn is a big, big problem and we can pile up on it, but instead pawn c5, which allows the bypass d5. And among other issues, the bishop on b6 now is just eh not a good bishop. We don't want this bishop. It, it kind of pains me that <laughs> that such an amazing continuation, a laudable, fantastic continuation, will hinge on this awful bishop later, because this bishop should have been opened up 
at so many opportunities that would have been very favorable. Now, this is a Skittles game, so I'm being really harsh to a great game, right? That's a little bit unfair, but this bishop is a bad bishop. You shouldn't make your bishops this bad, and such bishops karmically kind of shouldn't deliver beautiful, beautiful wins. So pawn takes d5 anyway, rook takes d5, and now a move that if you're going to argue that this game didn't happen and that Orchuetta versus Sans did, or that neither happened and the whole thing is kind of a post-mortem, I would say this move would stand out to me as being suspicious, a little bit sus. King h7, there's no reason I can see to play King h7 other than to set up the whole combination later on because it won't work if the king can be checked. But you know, other than anticipating a continuation that you couldn't possibly anticipate now, you would surely want to activate your rook and you wouldn't want to put your king over on h7. However, king h7 we do get. And I would also say that one move that's a little bit sus to me doesn't make me question the whole game. I think when you, you know, put together like a Skittles game afterwards, sometimes you like mix up moves. I've certainly kind of recreated a Skittles game where I wasn't taking notation. And if you're playing in a local club and not a serious tournament, you're often not taking notation. And I've often like inverted a move. So maybe something like that is also possible. Um, who knows? There are many things that are possible. Rook d7 here. Rook d8 going for the rook trade. The rook decides to stay active, but in doing so, it's giving up the whole uh, the whole uh, <laughs> d file to black, which is a little bit suspicious. Um, rook g6 threatening rook down here and piling up against g2. So we get rook over to g3, which is unfortunately a questionable move as well. G3 closing off this rook was a much better move. And after rook g3, white is in real trouble because we just trade here and the rook invades on d2. This is a critical juncture for white. There's only one other real choice available to white. And at this point, there's a long line that's been given by analysts that starts with a4 here. And this seems to be a way to save the game. You can allow black to take on b2, then play a5, which is going to win this bishop after rook b3, pawn takes and pawn takes, but now black has very strong pawns. Three connected pawns, even though um, two are doubled, and it looks like black just might win based on that, but white has enough counterplay. White's counterplay starts with knight d5, and then the c pawn's pushing forward, but now f5 with a big threat. <laughs> if the pawn pushes forward again, we get um, knight to f6 check, and its mate, which is very, very funny. The F pawn was needed to control the G6 square. Of course, black shouldn't allow that, and if black anticipates that, black can start to run with the king, but then rook B8 check, and it seems like white is getting enough counterplay. This is a long kind of computery line, but ultimately white can take on C3 um, and then take on B6, and here pawns are equal. The C pawn is obviously better than the pawns of the king side. In fact, you can actually pick up a pawn with rook takes g3, but f6, and it seems like pawns are coming off the board, and probably it's drawable for white. Probably, but it's still difficult. Instead, though, after rook d2, we get knight to a4. A very sensible move attacking this bishop, holding on to this pawn, but it now allows an incredible combination. If you've not seen this combination, definitely pause your video, try to work it out. Even if you have seen it, I encourage you to kind of work it out all in your mind again and make sure that you see all those variations. It's just worth doing. Black plays the spectacular rook takes b2. Incredible, giving up the rook to start the pass pawns rolling down the board. So knight takes b2, and now pawn to c3. Knights are often very, very bad um, <clears throat> in terms of dealing with passed pawns, and this is no different. If the knight goes to d3 trying to control the queening square, then there's c4 check, hitting the knight and creating a discovered attack. So rook takes b6, and if you take the rook, then you can blockade the pawns, but pawn takes d3. There's a famous bit of... Uh, um, knowledge, wisdom, and chess that two connected pass pawns on the six rank are stronger than a rook. This is a good example because if you try to stop either pawn, then 
Uh, actually, you can win in multiple ways, but the other pawn is going to go, and losing this pawn doesn't matter because a pawn is queening. You can switch over, but you're just trying to hold back, you know, waters <laughs> with your, your finger in the dam here because the pawns are pushing through. So after c3, this incredible move, we do get rook takes b6, which is absolutely the best try. So after rook takes b6, if you capture the rook, then the knight goes to d3, the pawns are blockaded, white is totally winning. But we still have resources. Pawn c4, now we're down a rook and a knight, but we simply push the c-pawn up the board, and we again emphasize that knights are very bad at stopping past pawns. The knight obviously can't go to d3 because we'll take it. We get the same position we had a moment ago. Um, if knight back to d1, there's just c2. We're threatening to take the knight and make a queen, and we're threatening to just make a queen, right? And um, back here, uh, knight takes c4 is the most spectacular line, and now c2, <laughs> and because you can't get to b1 and the c pawn, the c file is blocked, you cannot stop queening. Now, this is actually the best try for white, and after the only move, rook c6, defending this knight and allowing black to queen, it's not clear that black can win this position. Black is better, black has a lot of opportunities, but it also seems like white might have a fortress. It's unclear, but this is definitely, definitely the best try. Instead though, after c4, we see rook b4, which looks like a total refutation at first, because if you take the knight, then the rook just takes and white is winning. Um, and if you push c2, then the rook takes on c4 and the pawn is stopped. So it looks like rook b4 and White is just laughing, like this is just over. What were you trying to do being so brilliant? But black has one more move and it's pawn to a5, another pawn move. So the rook is under attack and the b4 square is taken under control, which is critical. So white can really only take here on c4 in this position with the rook and the knight, but neither work. After rook takes, pawn takes, now we're just unavoidably queening down here because the rook can't go to either square. This is why it's important, by the way, that the king is on h7 because if the king were not on h7, we could check and come around and stop the pawns and win the game. So in the game, we actually see knight takes c4, but now c2. This is worse than earlier though because earlier the rook and the knight were coordinating well and now they are not coordinating well. So this queening is totally winning as a moment ago when I showed you one of the, a very similar variation, it was unclear if black could win. Now, knight takes a5, we make the queen, king over to h2, queen c5. The white pieces are uncoordinated. If you try here the move rook over to a4, trying to hold on to absolutely everything in this position, there's queen check, king back, and queen d1 check, hitting the rook, hitting the king. So it didn't quite work, unfortunately for white. So anticipating this, white gives up the knight, rook back to b2. In situations like this, sometimes it's possible to arrange a fortress, but not here. In fact, it only takes a few moves to break the fortress. Queen takes a5, g4, uh, queen into e1, threatening to go queen h4 check and then pick up this pawn. So g3, and now h5 is a very nice move. After pawn takes king h6, the king is simply coming in and black is overwhelming the white position. In fact, in response to the excellent move king h6, white resigns. I hope you've enjoyed this game. It is a beautiful game. It is obviously not a perfect game, which is something that I actually enjoy because I'm not a perfect player. Probably you aren't a perfect player either. So it's really nice to see a game with some flaws, some significant flaws that ends in fantastic brilliancy. You know, we can all achieve that given the right opportunity, the right position. There's an opportunity in chess for glory for average players, above average players, in addition to the super grandmasters. I also cannot really comment, as I've discussed throughout, about ultimately whether this game is the real game, whether Orchueta or Sans is the real game, whether neither is real, whether both are real. It's incredibly complicated and beyond us, but check out the description for more information and you can form your own conclusion. I obviously selected this game because the story around it does make sense to me, but I can't really know ultimately if this game is authentic.
If you want to see more of my best chess games of the 1930s, then simply click on the playlist that is popping up on your screen as I speak.